Welcome uh, to uh, the last session of today for Streaming Media Connect. I'm Eric Schumacher Rasmussen, the VP and editor of Streaming Media and the conference chair for Streaming Media Connect. We've had a great week of panels and presentations on everything from highly technical topics like encoding an ATSC 3.0 to more general strategy and business focused topics like live streaming and advertising. And the one we're about to have right now, a discussion of sports streaming. You'll note that we did not call this a sports and esports focused panel, which we have in the past, because we kind of realized that at this point, it's all sports. I even put on my, uh, my Milwaukee Brewers jersey, but I forgot that my, my new fancy webcam uh, has got, uh, got, got it zoomed in a little closer, but pitchers and catchers did report yesterday, so there is some light at the end of the tunnel for those of us in the colder climates, which unfortunately seems to be almost all of us right now. Next week, we've also got sessions. We've got workshops, deep dives into various uh, encoding and transcoding and FFmpeg and using vMix and things like that with streaming media contributing editors, Jan Ozer, Rob Reinhardt, and Sean Lamb, as well as presentations from industry vendors. So be sure to check those out and see if there's anything on the calendar for next week that uh, tickles your fancy. Before we jump in, I'd like to thank our Diamond sponsor, Limelight Networks, for sponsoring this entire week's worth of sessions and panels. And I would also like to thank the sponsor of this session, Intertrust Technologies, for joining us. And as I said, our panel is going to be talking about sports, traditional sports, esports, all of it, and how streamers can up their game, find new ways to engage viewers, and uh, and how social media-based sports creators can, can get their voices heard in the mix as well. We've got a really diverse mix of panelists here today, a real all-star lineup, and I will just let our moderator, Jeff Jacobs, take it away. Jeff, introduce yourself, and then our panelists will introduce themselves. Greetings, and thank you, Eric. Uh, and Eric, once again, congratulations on streaming media, putting together a couple of days of uh, of pretty uh, interesting programming, and you're, uh, you guys always have such a diverse um, uh, uh, um, program and you get people from all walks of life. Congratulations again. You guys have a terrific reach and it always, it's always, it always pays off. Today we have a terrific program. It's not based so much on, um, on, on live streaming during pandemics like so many of us have been listening to and heard about for the past couple of days, past few months, uh, but more how do we level up now? How do we level up? How do we up the ante? How do, we, uh, how do we up our sports streaming game? Uh, the reason I like this panel so much, it's a terrifically eclectic group, like Eric said. We've got on it the innovator, the producer, we've got the protector, the technologist, and we've got the evangelist. So it's a really, really good group. I look forward to the next 45 minutes to an hour of some good chat. Uh, before we begin, as Eric suggested, uh, fellas, why don't we go around the horn, introduce yourself. Uh, I, I would also say I'm Jeff Jacobs. After years at NBC Sports, after years of MTV and Viacom, I'm now the general manager of Ven, which of course is the video games entertainment news network. It's a long story. If you want to know about, more about it, Google it. Um, but, uh, but that's what I'm doing. It's good for me because we are the esports and gaming uh, lifestyle and, uh, and tournament play. So it's, it's really a good place to park my skills for a few years. Uh, I'll see how it goes. Um, so moving forward, let's go around the horn. Let's introduce ourselves. Let's start with Darcy. Maybe Darcy's frozen. Let's go with Jeff. Hi, this is the other Jeff. This is Jeff Keithley. I'm the owner of Live Sports and uh, the executive director here. We basically are uh, live sports streaming. Have been in streaming since it began, literally in. Uh, around 1998, 99, started down the streaming path with some very old and very antique gear as you would see it in today's standards. Uh, now we're streaming in 4K and using robotic cameras that are taking, uh, taking us to a whole nother level, have been for the last few years, uh, a distributed workflow through the cloud infrastructure that we built and maintain, uh, doing, doing a lot of things in different sports and in, uh, really enjoying this. Cool. Ali? Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Ali Hajat. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on this panel. Uh, I am responsible for product marketing at Intertrust Technologies. Uh, Intertrust Technologies offers content protection and anti-piracy services uh, for streaming platforms, generally for media entertainment. 
We have uh, some of the largest streaming platforms that are using our multi-DRM cloud-based service, as well as our anti-piracy solutions. Uh, we offer also broadcast TV security for direct-to-TV uh, content protection, as well as application shielding for streaming apps and services. So I'm excited about today's discussions. Cool, welcome. Magnus, where are yeah. you and uh, what time is it? It's 9.30 in the evening, so it's, it's not that bad. Uh, I'm Magnus Svensson, work at a company called iWin Technology based out of Stockholm, Sweden. We are media specialist or streaming specialist, all from strategic advice, technical advice, and all down to development. Myself, I work as a media solution specialist working globally to, to support the media industry with, with technology expertise around streaming. Cool. Welcome. And Darcy? Okay, um, am I here now? I did discover earlier I was the oldest guy in the panel, so maybe I, my old guy brain kicked in. Spent 30 years uh, in sports and uh, entertainment uh, comms and uh, mostly sports streaming, uh, live streaming up till about eight years ago when I pivoted to uh, gaming and competitive gaming and now you know, what they call esports. So hopefully we'll be able to give you guys some of our no the knowledge that I've uh, accumulated over those years uh, in this panel today. Cool. Welcome. I think that's it. Hey, um, before we start getting real specific, Magnus, you're the um, you're the evangelist, you're the theorier, you're the deep thinker, and you're also the one latest at night, so we may drop you. You want to give <laughs> us a minute or two on what you see the streaming, the A-plus level of streaming, what the environment is out there? You want to give us a little overview as to the streaming environment as you see it of late? Absolutely. And I, I think needless to say in this panel and with this audience, uh, the broadcast is moving and streaming streaming sports is moving from broadcast into the streaming world. And it, it's more, more and more we'll see it's a streaming exclusive environment that we're moving into. And I think what we have done the last one or two years is actually moving away from mimicking a traditional broadcast into actually start leveraging the technology of streaming and, and actually building something that we'll be discussing today. We'll see, we have seen a changed behavior. We have seen that, that, that the young, maybe the mostly the younger audience is looking more at highlight clips, snapshot type of things instead of a full watching the full games. We see interactivity coming in with coming with the esport community because the esports is coming from a totally different end coming in with chat interactivity and synchronization and that that brings the technology to to some advanced technologies like low latency streaming we need to get the devices in sync later on we'll see 5g really exploding the market with extending the reach to you basically can have live sports streaming in low latency wherever you are in the world and you will, will that will that with that will have things like sitting at the arena watching highlights watching the game do some augmented reality on top of the streaming experience while while sitting at the arena but i think what will will traverse during this panel a lot is is the convergence between Esports and sports, and what the traditional sport can learn from the esports interactivity and, and and adapting to change. I also would like to mention the, the the other technology advancement we see now with co-streaming, where where you can actually take a sports feed and do some co-streaming, put that in a different environment with a different with a different commentating or a different totally different environment, like the the traditional Twitch streamers bring the, the sports into their typical new environment and, and by that getting new audiences to the sports. That's a lot, cool. Uh, Jeff, tell us about what you've been doing the past six to nine months, not only how you've been work, developing workarounds and solutions during a pandemic, but also what you've been able to take advantage of to up the ante. And please also include, because we were talking the other day about the drone and the SIM. I, I had mentioned to you, I watched Jerome Sports two, three weeks ago on NBC, and it was all in a simulator. It was genius, genius, probably a result of pandemic, but really, it was yes. live esports. Jeff, go. One of my favorite projects in the last six months. Uh, we, we worked with the guys at uh, Drone Racing League and built them out a complete 
production studio in the cloud. Everything's being ingested there. It's being controlled. It's being treated. It's multiple vMix machines along with the Sienna processing engine and the Backbone 2 engines actually uh, running. And it, it just really turned out to be something that nobody thought it could be done. Uh, but we've been working, my company has actually been working in the cloud and, and working with the distributed workflow for, for years, well before the pandemic. When the pandemic hit, it was like, okay, so it's business as usual. This is normal for us. Uh, working in our rooms, controlling cameras across the country, that that's normal for us. Uh, so now as we just added more things to it, but with the, the DRL, it was just a really fun project to work with them. They sent out specific gear to the homes. They had uh, a very nice camera set up, a very nice uh, dedicated computer for each one of the players slash pilots. And then they brought them all back in the simulation. The simulation, they, the players or pilots actually said that it was like they were, it's so close to flying an actual racing drone. It just was like, we're just uh, like normal now. And so uh, they they really got into it and really enjoyed it. And uh, and whenever we started talking about output, it was like, okay, where's this gonna go? Cause I, we all assumed, oh, just streaming. Oh no, uh, it's going to NBCSN. And then it was like, oh, well, we're gonna be on the Peacock also. So uh, that was a really big, I, I saw this as a huge shift that now a company as large as that really considering all this workflow that's being done in the cloud and the, all the production in the cloud, they're considering that as an option. And, and it, it wasn't just an option, it was a complete solution. So I think overall, that was the biggest thing I saw change in the last six, six seven months for sure. But at the end of the day, we're still streaming sports, call it esports, call it live sports, whatever you want. What have you done to up the ante? What have you done making improvements and all that? Uh, for us, for sure, is definitely uh, growing out to other sports. Uh, kind of like what Magnus was saying, where things are the the niche sports are are getting play now. They're they're having they're having more coverage because we can do it more effectively. So we can use and leverage the power of the cloud to produce things that are not the normal sports that you would only see a few or five or six normal sports online or on on the air at all. Now we're seeing things like one of my clients is paddle ball, uh, platform tennis. Uh, these, these are things that would never see the light of day, uh, but now there's four or 5,000 people watching it on a weekend and you never would have thought that. So that's a big part that's changing for us is getting into those other sports that never got coverage before. Where are you distributing paddle ball and that sort of thing? Just curious. I'm Currently curious. right now, it is going to uh, more of the publicly available places like YouTube and, and just more of a general. They're not really monetizing it yet into the gaming uh, spectra, but our uh, the biggest part of our business is professional tennis, and whenever we have professional tennis going, we are sending it overseas uh, to the gaming companies over there that are, are basically doing betting and such on it. So uh, it, that's starting to come back around. We're starting to get more and more into the ATP schedule. We're getting more dates, uh, but that is where the majority of our content has been the last eight or nine years has been going overseas. Uh, and then the I guess you call it the public consumption, uh, the feel good stuff that everybody likes to see. Those people here in the U.S. we're not a big betting company uh, or betting country, uh, mostly because the laws prohibit it. But it's starting to start pick back up, and I, I see more and more people are getting into that. Hmm, interesting, uh, Jeff. What have you been doing lately up there in Canada? I mean, uh, Darcy, rather. What have you been doing up there in Canada that you're you're most impressed with yourself about? Well, the country's in Canada. I'm in the beautiful desert of Arizona. But uh, oh, I thought you were. Oh, the company's in Canada, but you're yeah. down. So look, they, uh, th this last eight year journey has really last year took you know probably five years of our future into into six months. Right. And uh, we've been really playing on that blurred line, we have a crossover of uh, gaming and sports. And of course, we fo we lean in heavily into the sports oriented games. Uh, no no doubt, we 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 support Fortnite and Call of Duty and many of those other things, but we see that uh, this, uh, you, you mentioned earlier, what are the innovations going on? Well, uh, first of all, you have, you've you got this crossover of different uh, audience in different places, old people watching lean back experiences in sports and you know, 18 to 35 year olds playing interactive experiences and leaning forward heavily and you know playing, doing six different things at the same time. 
So all these gamified experiences now are kind of converging in this, you know, mushed up world between sports and esports. Data visualization is big for us. Automation of production workflows, uh, making machines do people work, it, not new to us. I mean, I, that, I did that back, you know, 20 years ago with broadcast automation, but now it's real uh, AI and machines are doing the work. They're, they understand what the numbers in a jersey are. They understand a, you know, what a car uh, looks like uh, in a race. They understand what a goal is. Uh, and these machines can render these experiences and these in the data about those experiences in very interesting ways, like they are in games. And uh, so I think just the pure convergence of data and the visualization of data and the video, whether it's a game or, a, uh, or whether it's a real sport, is very interesting and you saw it, you know, lots of these ex examples during last year, but they've, they've started to ramp up very heavily. The Super Bowl was very heavily oriented towards those kind of experiences. You can watch uh, NFL games on Nickelodeon, which didn't even look like a game in some cases. So I think that, you know, uh, this convergence of game experiences and real experiences in sports is really where the interesting uh, blurred lines are. And uh, that's where we play heavily. We're, we're trying to figure out everything that machines can do that humans used to do. Because the scale is huge. I mean, we've, in this company I'm in now, we did 19 million events in five years. You know, imagine doing that many live sports events. You know, back in the, in the sports days, the best year was 28,000 events. And that was even a lot. And that was a lot of people. You know, now that we did 19 million with, you know, a little under 100 people. So, it's, it's really, truly, uh, I think the innovations in gaming and sports and that convergence is really an interesting place to be. Can you elaborate on some of your automated production systems that you mentioned? I'm wondering if some of those automated systems might be interesting to some people online, but also how they helped some of your productions up the ante and level up in terms of production and creative, what they enable you to do technologically to help up the ante. Yeah, look, it's again, machine driven workflows, but uh, the fact that the tools are in the cloud, you know, we don't have master control. We don't roll trucks. Everything's in a cloud. Everything that you expected to be in a truck before or a master control in a production facility are tools you can get over the web uh, or some other dedicated connection. And if you're working with, you know, some of the real big tool providers like Tata Communications is a good example. They have an entire portfolio of automated tools and you can rent them. I don't have to build a master control. I don't have to roll trucks. I don't have to have people out in the field. I can do everything from kind of what we're doing now. I mean, I'm not saying Zoom's a production tool that's going to stand up against a sports, live sports event, but they're very Zoom-like experiences. And, uh, and then the, all the overlays that used to be in Chirons and massive amount of graphic CGI people, it's all machines driving that now. So it's really interesting to see all the big providers and network companies providing these edge you know, things. Limelight's one of our sponsors here. So give them a shot. You know, they're trying to figure out what you need at what time and providing the encoding infrastructure and other tools. And, you know, th these marketplaces for tools and things are all out there and you can even go get the graphics people on, you know, for a buck an hour off offshore if you want. So it's really interesting to see uh, all that coming together and clouds, not just about the, the capacity of the network. It's about the features and capabilities of producing things in the network without all those, you know, things that burn gas and, and time uh, in, in our worlds previously. Man, you are lucky to be doing this at this time of day. Uh, many of us are obviously. Um, it's so much fun. As a reminder, we'll be taking questions at uh, maybe a little bit after the top of the hour. So log your questions into the Q and A. We'll go into it and ask your questions. Hey, Allie. Uh, moving forward, uh, you know, you're the security guy, and, but, but also the protectorant, uh, but also the innovator. Um, so many things couldn't be done without you looking over them or developing workflows, technology, um, engineering, or just good old fashioned production workflows to protect people to be able to do what they want to do creatively, reach their production objectives. Ali, what have you been doing in the past nine months that really has helped other producers up their ante, level up the level of their production for viewership and maybe monetization. Yes, uh, I think uh, basically uh, focusing on uh, protecting live sports and e-sports and doing it so that you can do it with low latency streaming is important. Uh, we had a lot of piracy before pandemic, but actually piracy increased even more 
for live streaming during pandemic. And we have been focusing a lot on different techniques to enable live specific anti-piracy solutions. So whether it comes to protecting, again, a low latency multi-DRM solution where you have to reduce the time that it takes to encrypt the content or provide keys for live streams on the fly with the tight integration with the packagers and encoders, or whether it's about the new workflow to deliver DRM licenses to the devices in real time to manage the expectations that the consumers have. So again, everybody on the sports side, streaming side is comparing latency with the broadcast latency and trying to shrink it down to the same level has been a challenge. When we hear about uh, CMAF with low latency, uh, uh, Apple HLS with low latency, and these are all pushing the boundaries into how we can do a sports. But in order to do those securely, right, first is to, again, make sure the additional content protection workflow does not add any delay uh, to the platform. And then on the other side, when you're trying to detect piracy, right, there is a specific metrics that you need to follow. For example, how do you parse all the pirated contents that are happening during a live big event and identify which one is coming from which source, right? Uh, factors in terms of identifying the leaks, from which subscriber is happening. Again, there's different levels of that. We can get into more details of that. Because again, the workflow for live uh, streaming piracy is a little bit more challenging. In the past, obviously, for SVOD services or videos, uh, movies, right? There has been different uh, watermarking techniques. But when it comes to adding like a technically protection of the content in live streaming, there are new challenges. And that has been some of our exciting, you know, uh, you know technologies we have been working on. Can you give an example of a production that wanted to do something, but they were afraid to? So you were able to come in and utilize technology to enable them to grow their creative. And, 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 and if you want, I would even talk about like gaming or esports tournament play you, um, that really needs some security and protections. And the reason I bring that up, you know, even 10 years ago, when I was like producing some beach house, something for MTV. And we did like a, a game where we stuck the, the keys to a Honda in the sand and six contestants had to find them. But the lawyers were like, this has to be completely equal. So you can't have one, two, three, five. It has to be equal. Otherwise we could get sued. Some kid had an advantage over another kid. This is just common sense broadcasting anyway. So my point is in this new world of esports that carry such high purses, um, and, you know, you brought up latency. We can't have one of these conversations without the magic word of latency. You, you know, I'm doing esports tournaments online. I've got teams in, in Berlin and Poland and Long Beach, California. So, so, so there could be a disadvantage to some of this. So putting it back to esports and maybe even gaming, is there anything you've done to utilize technology to help productions grow their sport, make for a better experience? Ali. So I think one of the factors that should be considered here is about uh, the attack surface, right? And the fact that basically on multiple platforms and especially streaming apps, there is more uh, pressure, more, more pressure, more, more avenues for attackers to open up and attack the platform. So one of the new technologies have been actually really used is called application shielding or application protection. When you're using a streaming service, a streaming app, you need to not only protect the content itself, but protect the kind of the payments, the user information, all the factors that are useful, right? there, And they're, they kind of can be ignored, right? So the application protection works in such a way that basically uh, it enables, uh, you know, protection against tamper, uh, against uh, reverse engineering. So some of the software platforms in the zero trust environment can easily be reverse engineered. And then people can dig in information from the payments and credit cards as well as actually the keys that are used to protect either information, user informations, or even the content themselves. So that's one of the new technologies has been uh, proven actually uh, useful for uh, increasing revenue. When it comes to eSports, I actually wanna say another thing. Uh, although a lot of services are free uh, and uh, like they uh, might be uh, you know, offered uh, online for free, but there are attackers or pirates that are trying to really stream those and try to get ad generated revenue, right? And so looking at kind of the workflows that like uh, sports uh, streaming platform have used with subscription-based 
offering, as well as the whole workflow of DRM and anti-piracy embedded, that enables actually blocking some of these real streaming uh, challenges. And uh, I mean, really attackers might go to just restream on social media and just get paid fees from, you know, uh, channels that actually have more viewers. So these are the things that we have been looking into how we can enable to improve uh, rev actually monetization and revenue for the esports uh, service providers. You got all the buzzwords in there. Um, <laughs> you got it. I'm checking off the buzzwords. Of course, uh, latency is the new drinking game. Uh, you can't have a panel on any of these streaming conferences without discussing latency. So we try 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 to take a drink every time you say it. Um, keeping this keeping this pattern on with gaming and esports and tournament play for purses for, because for whatever reason it's that much more nervousness. Jeff, what have you done in terms of well protecting the product for your clients regarding gaming and esports with big purses? Well, we we have to do our due diligence on site. Uh, we're we're very adamant about watching. And uh, we're very particular because in, in our in our realm, especially professional tennis, it, it is it's been a challenge uh, because there's so much at stake in the gaming uh, side of uh, the betting side. We we want to do our our part. We make sure that all the data is moving as fast as possible. We make sure that our streams are as reliable as possible and also going out with the minimum amount of latency as possible. Um, so we're down to under four or five seconds in most applications. Uh, I can't go into particulars about what backhaul we're using because it's proprietary uh, to my clients and such, but uh, that is definitely something from the very beginning when we started down this path nine, ten years ago now uh, with working with gaming companies uh, that it was a huge thing to worry about. And it's, and it's just gotten better as technology has gotten better also. Uh, but for the most part, um, Ali, I'd, I would love to get more input on uh, on some of the ways of protecting because I see our streams go up and it's crazy how fast they show up on a Russian site. Like, I will see people, hey, we're watching this, and they're taking us like, that's my graphics. That's my shot. I know where that is. And it, it's there. It's within a matter of minutes. And it just baffles me that it is as rampant. And they'll put their branding on top of it, and sometimes they'll just leave it just as we are. And they're doing it just for views, or they're doing it, some of it, they're embedding it illegally but embedding it illegally to to run their own betting side off of it too so it is definitely a problem uh we probably don't see it as much like i said before because the u.s hasn't been that heavily involved as gaming and betting is overseas uh but we we definitely have to worry about this on a everyday basis pretty much when we're on tour darcy why don't we elaborate on what you've been doing with the same thing again gaming gamers, gambling, and I'd like to hear some more about World Fasters, gamer, sim racing, et cetera, what you've been doing. Sure, I'll start uh, tying into what folks said previously. I mean, for us, it's KYC, know your customer. On the player side, you know, we don't, there's nobody in our world that's playing for cash matches, uh, doing uh, skills-based stuff that we don't know. Um, we do, a, we have a really robust compliance process. Um, that's the place where humans still exist, by the way. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of data and information and clearly we have the ability to, again, KYC on, on a constant, you know, basis. On the other side, where we're streaming. Uh, we actually use GPN, uh, uh, you know, for that term is, it's a gaming private network. Uh, we use it for latency. Uh, we have a backbone that's very compliant in terms of packet encryption and delivery and, and none of that stuff steps on you know, what we have to do to deliver things on time for the different workflows and gambling's uh, the highest uh, susceptible to latency because, you know, after a certain period, it doesn't matter, uh, you know, unless it's outcome-based betting, but in, you know, all these microtransactions and things going on, it's all real time. So you really have to have, you know, real time delivery and seconds and milliseconds in our world are, are precious. On, uh, in terms of what you were talking about for world's fastest gamer, I mean, that's, will give us a little plug. I mean, that's, that is a perfect example of a crossover. We take mobile, console, PC, and simulator uh, and combine them all in this trajectory, bringing gamers from the gaming world and making them into real racing drivers. 
So that's been going on for, it started as GT Academy, now it's called World's Fastest Gamer, and that's been going on for the better part of a decade. And we've learned a lot about all the things we just talked about, privacy, security, compliance, uh, because there's a lot of people, and we get six, seven million people starting this competition at the beginning of the year. And, you know, at the end, somebody gets crowned and gets a million bucks in a career in racing. A lot of people want to, you know, be part of that and they want to cheat to do that stuff and they want to bring in their other things into the world that we don't want to be there. So we're constantly, you know, the pressure's on across mobile networks and fixed networks and all places where these people come from. And when, when they get into a simulator, then I'll tell you, there's where a latency really plays because not only you're sitting in a, a real thing that feels like a car and acts like a car, but it's a, you know, it's a device connected to the network and you're competing against 39 other people that are somewhere else in the world. And everybody has to be on the same page. So latency is a big thing. So we got to be able to, you know, bring them all into the same kind of window of latency. And then what we do is normalize them all. So there's no advantage on the technology side. If every, if, you know, some of them have 30 and some of them a hundred ping and we put them all at, uh, you know, 30 uh, or at hundred, sorry, the worst common denominator. We also can't have somebody at 200 even participating. So we actually are constantly looking at all the participants and making sure that that normalization is applied. Then it's all about skill. There's no more advantages of network latency. There's no advantages of performance of your PC. You're all in the same uh, playing field. And if you've ever played any of those games where latency plays, it's frustrating to get shot and you don't even know where the bullet came from or get passed and knocked off the track in a car because you, you, know, you didn't see it coming. So those milliseconds in a 200 mile an hour car on a virtual track, it means as much as it does on a real track. And you lose a two, three seconds, you, you could jump off the track. Everybody passes, you don't know what's going on. So we've always looked at that and we can't have those problems because the customer service issues that you get uh, when you start trying to play with, where's the game server, where are the players? Can we get everybody on some common platform? If you don't deal with that at the core level of network and, and normalization and latency, the rest of everything you do is, I don't care how good the experience is and all the great overlays and graphics, it's off the table because you just created a, you know, a shit storm for, uh, for the players with, uh, with latency and, or not latency. Darcy, is there anything that your company above the border has been doing that has helped up a client's, a client's sports streaming game, if you will, by, by, because as a result of pandemic programming, are there any examples that you've provided a more engaging service or a better product for your clients as a byproduct of the pandemic workflows? Oh, that's a tough question. It, it's, it's almost like saying, it's almost like saying, is the show better because people are on remote rather than in studio? Oh, and I think I it argue, is. I could argue one could get better talent that way. You can get better talent. You can work 24 by seven because you can follow the sun with uh, talent, um, customer service too. So the back end, back office, but the, in terms of production, yeah, I, we've always been believers in remote production and last year just took, you know, three, four years of, uh, of our future and put it into six months. I mean, we literally are all those races I just talked about. We were getting the odd placement on ESPN and these different places. We were the only game in town for six months. Uh, you know, of course, NASCAR and F1 and guys, you know, our partners jumped in, which is great, you know, but we would never have seen that take up on, you know, 85 broadcast networks for sim racing. And so I'd say that, you know, the sponsors were probably the best beneficiary of that because they had no where to go to reach that audience. They're already trying to get to this younger audience who don't go to racetracks anymore. So mostly it was about helping the sponsors to reach those folks. And then of course, what you said, bringing in, the viewers and the fans into the experience and allowing them to have a, you know, cheer remotely and virtually and having their face on the screen. It's really cool. It's, and, and it's, you know, that's what they expect. If you watch a Twitch stream, uh, they're, they're all in with each other and there's, you know, they're, they're chatting on one side and they're playing on the other and their faces somewhere else. That's all now happening on all the things we do. And I, I love the fact that you can just tune somebody in some talent like you know Juan Pablo Montoya is sitting down in his home in you know somewhere in Colombia and he's suddenly in the action he's actually racing and talking and commentating you couldn't fly all the talent in the world do that before so it's I think that's a great experience and is really uh, creating some good opportunities for for producers 
you know, Magnus, we'll come to you in a second. It's funny what you're saying, and we've all we've all experienced this. Everyone on this line, um, the pandemic has really sped up workflows that many of us were doing anyway already. Like it's funny, like about eight years ago, I was trying to get this one division, one channel, uh, digital workflows. They were still on HD cam, and the rest of the world was already on digital workflows. And the producers were referring to things as files, not tape. Finally. But this one channel would not turn over and move to a file-based production workflow. And um, it was amazing. And then you may or may not recall this, like eight years ago, maybe 10, um, there was like this tsunami in Japan. And Sony had sent memos around to everyone saying, the HD cam factory is underwater and we will be six months delayed in HD cam stock. Uh, true story. And, uh, and we would go back to the network and say, okay, guess what? You have to become file-based because there's no HD cam stock uh, <laughs> available. So it's funny how like forces of nature uh, uh, will, will accelerate certain technologies. Magnus, um, to you, my friend, uh, gaming, but also gambling. Uh, you know, gambling is a source, is a byproduct of live sports streaming and sometimes content itself. You doing anything with gambling? Uh, and I, I think I think Darcy is, but you doing anything with gambling nowadays? And is there anything going on in your part of the world of technology and streaming uh, that again people have utilized this odd time to up the ante and up the level of their streams? I would say coming back to we have discussed a lot of latency, and it, it's quite funny that this this phenomenon has been discussed for years. When when Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon for the first time that would broadcast back to earth in six seconds so that was possible that time and we're still discussing on getting the latency down to seconds and and i think there are technologies to get the latency down enough for the different use cases and you can use the the SEMA for the apple low latency that ali talked about or proprietary versions but i think in most cases i think the synchronization is more important than the latency that everybody is in sync with each other and sync with overlays sync with statistics and sharing and whatever you have so i, I think that has been something i've been working with a lot with with customers to get get the, the second screen experience get the chat in sync with the the broadcast and the and latency latency can be solved in more or less complicated and, and costly ways and I think the cloud vendors are coming in with latency solutions now that brings latency down pretty drastically to levels that anyone from home can start start doing some some quite low latency streaming from their homes. And like I said, with with superstars can can interact with the the the, the viewers. And and I think the trend now is to do some, some what I mentioned before with co-streaming, that you'll you'll take a sports broadcast feed add your environment to it, add your commentators, add your celebrities talking to it or wherever that fits into your world and, and bring bring sports to a different environment than what it used to be. I think that is a trend that I think we'll see more of. If you look at the Q&A, Bob has asked more questions about latency. Darcy gave a, uh, a fine solution uh, Jeff, do you want to throw in your thoughts real fast? Because chances are, I, I, or, or in, unless we've beaten this question to death yet. But Jeff, Jeff, you want to just share with us your thoughts about Bob's question briefly? Yeah, I was, I was just reading it uh, just to make sure I was, I was synced yeah. up with him on that. Uh, so camera crew on site and uh, director, producers, graphics, everybody else off site. Uh, two to three seconds is actually pretty long in in most of our workflows were well under a second so i um it's just a matter of using the right process so there's definitely sources that of getting whether it's using live view for backhaul or srt or depending on if you have to depend on cellular uh there's you know live view tv a multitude of different cellular bonding solutions now uh but also srt is probably one of the biggest things that came out and really just blew up during the pandemic because it gave us a more reliable 
uplink stream uh, to be able to get out to multiple people, m multiple sources to be able to get out to multiple uh, locations. And uh, we're, so we're, we're definitely leveraging a bit of S SRT. Uh, WebRTC is also something which is effectively what we're using now with Zoom. Uh, WebRTC is also something we're using to reflect back uh, multiviewers as such. Uh, that is without a doubt acceptable enough. It may not be to broadcast standard uh, just because WebRTC is a little funky about whether or not it wants to go full rate or not. And so got to work with that. But if you're just needing something for confidence for a commentator to follow along, that's one thing. Uh, you could definitely use WebRTC to, uh, as a reflection back. So there's definitely uh, tools and there's others, uh, just like Darcy mentioned, there's others out there that they're specifically building those backhaul solutions as more of a proprietary or, or as a managed service to be able to get the latency and everything low enough to be able to use. But in our applications, uh, we're definitely under a second. And it, after just a little bit of adjustment, it it's just second nature now. It really is. Uh, same thing for our camera operators. At first, we were kind of worried about, you know, was the latency going to be like? Now, um, you're, you're, it, you, the human brain is amazing. It's It just gets used to that little bit of latency. A um, couple of my guys are gamers. So when they get on the line and they see it and they're literally on the LAN with the system, they're like, oh, wow, this is really fast. But I'm like, yeah, but you're on site. Of course it's going to be. But whenever they're across the country, they're following the director just the same, whether I've got a guy in Fort Wayne, I've got a guy in, in Atlanta, and they're controlling cameras there in California. And that is just, it's just normal once you get used to that lower latency. But you just got to have the right tools in place. That's all. They do exist. By, by the way, it's so funny. You know, I've been very involved in esports more recently than ever before. It's funny you say you, got, you guys are gamers. I am finding that technicians like TDs, graphic artists, uh, 3D animators, gamers, I'll just say this, even though it's ridiculous. Gamers make extremely excellent TDs, editors, 3D animators. They, they, they get it, and it's in their brain, and it's like they're trained from a young multitasking. age. Multitasking. They can multitask. Yeah. That's the key. They can do more. I, I personally can multitask really well, but I cannot move left and look right at the same time and shoot straight. I just I can't do it. I, but I can do one or the other. But that's the multitasking is what we're finding from them. That and the dexterity of being able to use those thumbs to do more than just up and down. They literally can add all those other fingers in. And it's, it's pretty amazing to see them adapt. If you're a successful gamer, you've, you've had to uh, train yourself on graphics to, to you know, create some uh, awareness of yourself, not just a stupid stream on Twitch, but uh, something that looks cool and has graphics. Uh, and and it's, it, back to cloud, it's all online. So all those tools, they don't have to buy switchers and have to buy master control pieces and all that stuff. They can get it all on some app or some web uh, enabled uh, uh, capacity that that's created a whole layer of those folks. And the, by the way, they can also create games. Oddly enough, they're also great programmers. So we have, I'd say 80% of our staff are gamers uh, easily and, you know, except, and I even game and I'm an old guy. So. Fantastic. Allie, you're laughing at these guys. Is it because you think they're foolish or because you know something they don't know? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. This is exciting, actually. I, I totally agree. I mean, I honestly have not been a big gamer in my life, but I see, I mean, my kid and like the younger generation going crazy at it. And I, it makes sense. And I mean, uh, no, no, I'm laughing because no, I'm, I'm relating. It's, it, it, <laughs> it's cool. Fun. Uh, anything to add, Ali? While you oh no. Uh, and, well, I mean, again, from my angle, I mean, this is a big industry. It's gonna grow more and more. I mean, we're talking about this now. I mean, eSport has been like uh, growing. I mean, increasing number of people, surprising increasing number of people are looking at it, watching it these days. And I'm sure it's going to grow significantly long, more, much more. So again, protecting the revenue for generated from these, uh, you know, uh, streaming services is important. And there are, again, uh, Darcy mentioned a lot of, you know, uh, compliance, a lot of uh, piracy and also privacy related issues. So again, we have to keep in mind the best use cases or best, uh, you know, uh, lessons learned from other services when there was a live sports and to, uh, to adva take advantage of those when it comes to eSports as well. 
Right. Hey, Magnus, instead of typing an answer to Chris's question, why don't you just open your mic and, and give us all your insight? Yeah, I, I was about to type in an answer there. And I think definitely streaming will grow. But I, I doubt that this Olympic game in Tokyo will be the turning point where streaming will be take presence over the traditional broadcast. I think we'll a couple of years away from that before the networks are built out and the CDNs and then the whole infrastructure is built out for taking the whole load of traditional broadcast. But I think definitely we'll see a a growth of streaming, but but the Olympics in Tokyo will not be the breaking point where streaming is, is taking presence over broadcast. Okay, assuming Tokyo is going to happen. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think everyone agrees that Tokyo <laughs> will happen. Uh, I used to work at NBC Olympics, so I'm, I'm a little like, uh, I, I'm, I'm pro Olympics or I'm optimistic. I think everyone knows they'll happen. I think we're now in the phase where it'll happen. It'll probably happen with like, you know, every eighth seat, even I'm guessing. Um, I think everyone agrees with that. But um, but back to the back to the OTTs. Uh, can anyone share any experience, Jeff? Maybe you could start. Anyone share any experience with how it's going with feeding these OTTs? I'm also interested in what mechanism people are using to hit the OTTs. They seem to be growing. They seem to be used to up the games between Twitch and the OTTs. Which uh, which Cheddar would like to call post cable uh, between the between the OTTs and Twitch, it seems like we are definitely upping the sports streaming game. Uh, Jeff, your thoughts about that? My feelings on it, on it are pretty simple. It's like if you're not everywhere, then you're not anywhere. So you you should if you if you're trying to put your brand out there and trying to grow people you have to make it as easy as possible to be able to get to them so if you're exclusive in just one area and one streaming service or one cdn or or just your website you, you're leaving money on the table you should be looking to every avenue possible to get your stream out there and to get your content seen darcy your thoughts about that especially ott's distribution twitch you know i had mentioned i don't want to give them a plug but I, I had mentioned before we, I think we went live that I'm involved somehow. Let's just say we're, we're, we're involved with FCF football and, and they've really, I can't believe I'm giving them a plug, but we'll use them as a case study. They've really upped the aim, up the ante, up the game by utilizing Twitch and enabling the fans to make decisions for that game. I mean, the fans are calling the plays. It's fascinating, terrific. They couldn't do that without Twitch and, um, and a, a true second screen experience. Uh, uh, Darcy, you do a lot of that. Can you talk about distribution, OTT, how OTTs and maybe Twitch is helping up the game? Yeah, look, you have to, as uh, Jeff said, we have to, you have to be everywhere that you can. And uh, you know the, the place you want to go and throw a net out to get the eyeballs are those public... Uh, places like YouTube and Twitch and et cetera. So if you can get there, uh, you should be there. And especially at the beginning, problem with those places is they have restrictions. You know, Twitch says you can't do a live production here and then also have it over somewhere else. So they, it's contractually obligated. And the, most people don't know that, but those poor Twitch streamers have a, you know, have a rope around their neck when it comes to trying to go out elsewhere. That said, you know, they've created a place where billions of people aggregate, so why not? Uh, but you also have to think about your own uh, distribution and your private kind of uh, reach. And OTT is commodity. I mean, the tools, you can get them anywhere. I'm sorry to say that. I mean, we're, we're an OTT provider. We have 1,200 customers on our, uh, what used to be their Frankly Media platform. It's mostly news distribution. Um, so you have to actually have other tools and things to make the interesting. But just in general, I go with the get, be as many places you can out of the gate and then try and refine what gets you the best return as you go. The first thing you have to get is eyeballs and you're not gonna build that day one on your own O and O unless you know, you're starting as one of the you know, people that you know, somebody's bought your rights and of course then you can sit back and collect the check. But in general, you mentioned earlier the, you know, these amateur sports or smaller kind of things that would never see the light of day on a broadcast network, that 5,000, 10,000 subs is a nice number in, uh, in this world. So just go out and find that magic number that gets you your content paid for and then figure out what you do next. And if you want to go private or start going into your own kind of reach, 
then uh, the tools are there. It's easy to embrace. They're all virtual. We've already talked about that. And, uh, you know, you pay by the usage, which is an awesome play. OTT is like the old web used to be. When I first went into web, it was, you know, a million bucks for a web page. And then Wix made it zero. And, you know, that's kind of where the tools are right now. Of course, the production and everything still has to have that value. And that's where the layer you got to put on top of these, these systems and tools and outlets that you're going to use. When you say you uh, handle 1,200, I'm sorry, Ali, did you have something on that? Yeah, yeah. I just want to second that what Darcy was saying, specifically OTT commodity. I like that uh, phrase. I mean, OTT streaming has been along for a while, right? I mean, I hear what Magnus is saying in terms of maybe Tokyo is not the full transition from broadcast to streaming, but we have seen actually a streaming grow significantly in the sense that today setting up a new streaming channel is not hard. It's easy on the cloud platforms using all the uh, you know, the cloud-based encoders, AWS frameworks, and all the other vendors that offer even the CDNs and delivery to the consumers. It's really very straightforward to set up a cloud-based uh, OTT streaming channel. And even more better than that, you can protect it with DRM in 30 minutes. In 30 minutes, you can set up all the license rules that you want, how to actually protect that content going from your production all the way to the subscribers tuned to that channel. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, that, that's the key. Uh, it's going to grow more, obviously. There, there are certain areas in the world that they're still relying on broadcast. But I think, again, for the most part, a lot of U.S. and Europe have turned that point, And I think it's going to keep going that way. So that's what I kind of wanted to say. Uh, seconding Darcy's point. Ali, while we're, while we're probably wrapping this up in a few minutes and, and while your mic is open, I, I know you're a deep thinker, Ali. Anything else you want to discuss that's, uh, that's coming to mind? that you want to discuss in here, especially experiences on how people are in fact upping their streaming game and leveling up the experience? Yeah, so I just want to kind of enforce the fact in terms of finding the piracy on the web and stopping it. And yeah. I think Jeff brought it up again to get more details on that. So there are technologies that we call basically for uh, web crawling and digital fingerprinting, where you're producing a content, you know, even live content, you're actually generating a digital signature on the fly to know where this content is being licensed for. So when you find actually a content pirated on the web, you can actually understand easily from which licensee it was being leaked. So this is really important. That's what we call web monitoring or content monitoring on the web. That's really important for sports. It has been actually one of the requirements from some of the premium, uh, you know, soccer national leagues in Europe, in UK, uh, Premier League has it as one of the requirements. So, and this can be extended to eSports as well. So that's one of the things that I wanted to highlight. And then the second phase is really about how you identify the subscriber. There are uh, basically client side uh, specific uh, watermarking solutions that are easy to integrate, whatever target platform you have, whether it's a mobile device, a browser, you can easily add a plugin to put a watermark as the content is being consumed by the subscriber. And so having that level of uh, you know, additional protection on, right, would enable you to identify which of the subscribers are actually leaking that content. And that would solve some of the problem that Jeff is saying that right away you see the uh, content popping up in Russia, you can actually really identify if SNC it was if it had that digital fingerprint generated during production. So again, paying attention to these for the live streaming is actually one of the things that is going to enable, you know, protecting the revenue for all the streaming service providers, for all the eSports uh, service providers. I hope that was just take in. All right. There's a lot to take in. And, you know, I've got a page of notes here. Um, there's so much that we could probably talk for two hours, but before I throw back to Eric from Streaming Media, uh, let's go around the horn and uh, maybe some of you have a final thought. We'll go with Jeff, Darcy, then Magnus. Jeff, final thoughts? I think that now that we've been through this pandemic, I really feel like that we are going to see more and more content out there just because people are going to be, they're starving for it. I, I know whenever I turn on the TV, the few times I do, um, I'm just scrolling and scrolling and scrolling because I can't find anything that I want to watch because I've watched it all. Um, so I feel like that there is going to be a higher demand as we become a little bit back to normal of sorts. I think there's going to be such a high demand of content that uh, those of us that are in this business are going to be pretty busy, to say the least. 
Yep. Darcy? Yeah, I think the genie's out of the bottle from last year. And I think the acceleration is, you know, going to force everybody to finally, you know, it's not a must, it's not a nice to have anymore. It's a must have to have streaming as part of your portfolio of things you do to distribute your content. Um, whether it's your only way or, or part of it, it's, it's meaningful. And, you know, the last thing I'd say is your audience is changing. You know, wake up. The uh, old guys like me aren't your audience. It's the people with the wallets that are playing games don't care about what you're doing uh, on broadcast and need you to be in, in, in where they are uh, and not where you think that you want them to be. So streaming is the means and uh, the live streaming, you, you got to get around it. And good news is there's lots of places to go for help. Um, these kind of panels will help you, but you know, even the folks on this panel, I'm sure you can would take a email or a call, you know, ask for help. There's lots of it out there. Lots of people that can help. It's a lot of competent people in this business now not just a bunch of tech geeks uh, like we were back in the day. You know, it's serious business. Reach out. Don't don't be afraid to ask. Uh, everybody's there to help. Cool. Magnus, your thoughts? I would be happy to help. And and I think my final thought is, is, is following up to, to what Darcy just said is that I think we'll see that the same type of content will be leveraged in different formats with, with highlight, with snaps, with, with Instagram feeds, with syndication of the same content moving to different platform, different formats and, and different, different audience. So I saw that Discovery will do snap daily snaps from the Olympics to, to broadcast in Snapchat. So I'll, I think we're still more and more of, of, of using the same content feed, but in different formats, different platforms, different audience. So much fun. Um, I think everyone had their final thoughts. Eric, back to you at 428. That was phenomenal. And uh, I see some of our panelists are putting their emails in the chat. Uh, and so look for those if you can, uh, if the rest of you would, would do that, if you're okay with doing that, that would be great. And I think, um, Darcy's absolutely right that all of us in the industry, uh, from all aspects and at all angles are, are always interested in helping. So that wraps things up. I'd like to thank once again, Intertrust for sponsoring this panel and Limelight Networks for sponsoring this whole week of panels and presentations. We will see you tomorrow for two more sessions, one on fast channels and one trying to predict what OTT is going to look like in 2025. Have a great rest of your day and we'll see you tomorrow.